Greg Sanford is, uh, obviously you see the signs, former president, CEO of Tractor Supply. And if you're from this area, you know their corporate headquarters is just down the road here at Maryland Farms. Uh, if you're not from here, you've probably seen their stores. Uh, in fact, Greg has, uh, before he retired, just a short while ago, you know, in Tractor Supply grew it to what, about 2,200 stores, 45,000 employees. And, you know, you just stop and think about that. And, that. and it'll be part of his story that he tells here, so I won't steal all that. But over 40 years of real retail experience uh, and all that, that encumbers, you know, marketing, branding, and of course in retail, the dreaded word supply chain. I do have a question on that a little bit later. <laughs> marketing, uh, you, you name it, customer service. And so we met, um, We've met several times. In fact, uh, maybe a, a question I'll tell about one of the f one of those times we had, a, I think, an interesting encounter in the airport. But I'll save that. But uh, actually, one of our students had invited uh, Greg to our MBA leadership class, and uh, and so we start a conversation after that about his passion to teach and share, uh, and especially uh, those younger in the business area and business field. One thing led to another, and so uh, Greg joined us as CEO in residence, and it's like, it, this is, I mean, this is just kind of, you know, unbelievable for us. We get, you know, to give Greg a, a great title and, and no pay. <laughs> and, <laughs> now, if I could just get the, kind of the faculty on the same system. <laughs> um, yeah, and they're already yeah, stepping it. out of the room. <laughs> but this ideal of and, and Greg's passion, this ties into servant leadership to give back and to work with uh, our students. Uh, in fact, what we have currently is, if you imagine this now, those of you who are alums, if you were a student here and in your capstone class, if you're young, young enough, some of you may remember Joe Ivey, still here torturing students. But in the capstone for the undergraduate or the MBA class, your strategy, the last class you take, I mean, you imagine doing a case on tractor supply and then have to present your results uh, to Greg. <laughs> is there any pressure there? And so this has just been great for us. You know, we've been able to have a series of folks uh, engagement with this business community. And of course, all that is to continue to improve the education uh, that we offer here. Um, so, you came to really not hear me, but I uh, am so glad to be able to know Greg, um, I mean personally, and his, the way he lives out servant leadership, and then as he'll talk uh, about how that was put into play in the corporate world. And so, Greg, I'll turn it over to you, and uh, I think I'll just stay up here, because okay. I have a few questions for you. I'll put you in charge of my book, don't let me forget that. Okay, well, hold this book. <coughs> now, <laughs> yeah, because at the end, I'm going to do a commercial about some books. Now, notice, you see, Greg already, already got one. I was telling uh, Ray, I'm an incessant reader. I love to read and learn. And maybe it's just the intellectual curiosity I have or have had. But when I see something that looks interesting, I'll pick it up, you know, buy it. I may skim through it. I may read it completely. I may not. Depends. But I have, I think, business book-wise, over 1,000 in my library at home. You get an idea, it's crazy. So if you ever need one, call me, I've got plenty to share. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about my journey on, on servant leadership and really what it means to me and what it meant to my coming to uh, Tractor Supply because um, I started my career federated. You know today is Macy's, unfortunately, not doing as well as they should have and could have, but, that's, but the years ago, but they used to be department store chains. And um, there were lots of them all throughout the country. Best training programs for a retail career you could find was a department store. And it was usually a three to five year program. And if you made your way through that, you'd start with maybe 60 students uh, right out of college, maybe 10, 11 would finish because it was not easy. You weren't paid well. Your friends that went to work for the bank made more money than you did, you know, but over time, you made a lot more money than they did, <laughs> but you had to stick it out. But um, what I learned many years ago was it's not about me and what I'm able to do. 
it was really about the people I worked with and how could I help them be successful, which in turn would make me successful. Now that sounds a little maybe counterintuitive. And I was saying to Ray earlier, when you put the, the terminology of servant leadership, you break it apart, servant, somebody who is, you know, subservient to someone else. And then leadership, that's kind of top down. You say, well, how do you put these two together and how does it make sense? Well, it, um, you, you have to live through some scenarios, I think, to understand it fully. And um, in life and at Tractor Supply, I take credit for nothing. There is a team of people there, 45,000 strong, who built that company. I just happened to be lucky enough to be the guy that was calling the shots in some places, um, kind of leading the herd, you know, in one direction or another. But I will not take credit for the success of that company. The people that are there today are the ones that made it successful. And, um, and it continues to be, even through COVID. They, I was telling Ray, picked up $2 billion, yes, with a B, in sales in 2020. When other retailers were cratering, crashing, they were just killing it. Now, if you understand the customer there, you, you know, they didn't, it gave them more time to work on their properties and so on and so forth, and it just fed off of itself. Um, so in, in troubled times, consumers who have property, who have animals, who live this lifestyle, won't give it up. They spend more time doing what they love to do, and that's why that company did extremely well, and they're still doing well today. So servant leadership, what does it mean? It's serving those who serve those who serve those who serve those. Think of an upside down pyramid. At the top, or let's put it in perspective at retail. These are your team members working with your customers. There's 45 or 40 some odd thousand of them. And as this pyramid goes down at the bottom, that's where the CEO sits, that's where the senior management's at. Our jobs are to serve those above those who serve, who serve, and go all the way up so that those at the top, which is really the mass of the individuals within an organization, so that they can be successful. And it takes work. It takes commitment. Um, it's thinking of others before you think of yourself. And that may be hard for some people. But I'll tell you, I get more gratification out of helping others giving others support, and sometimes it's financial, sometimes it's you know, mentorship or whatever, and seeing them you know, do well following that than anything I think that I've ever done. When I was a uh, senior manager and you know, coming up through the ranks of my, the retail companies I worked in, um, I didn't realize I was practicing servant leadership. I just thought I was being you know, a better team member, you know, being part of the team, working as a team. But what I found myself doing was following um, kind of a pattern of putting others before myself every time. And every time I did that, it seemed like I progressed. You know, I moved up another rank, I moved up another notch. And it was kind of ironic because here I am pushing everybody else up and yet I got pulled ahead. So maybe, maybe somebody in management saw something in me, I don't know. But let me, let me tell you a few things about servant leadership. There's, there's really five major steps that you have to kind of think about and consider if you really want to embrace servant leadership. And if you think about some of the great servant leaders, Mother Teresa, you know, Jesus Christ, I mean, he was a servant leader. I mean, you can, you can go on and on and think of different people through history or through you know, theology who, who, who were servant leaders. They all had empathy and they all had the effect of trying to heal, help someone heal. They all had commitment to developing or growing others or helping others. They all had a little bit of foresight and they felt like they were stewards, stewards of a group, stewards of an organization, but they were stewards. They, they had the ability to listen. And when I say listen, I don't mean you just hear it. You listen, you hear the passion in someone's voice. You hear the, the concern or the excitement. That's, that's truly listening. And they were very persuasive. Think of the people I just mentioned. Persuasion's important in, in, in servant leadership. Because sometimes you have to get people, individuals, to move in a direction that maybe isn't comfortable for them. It's possibly they've been there before and they said, oh yeah, we, 
Been there, done that, tried that before. I mean, how many times did I hear that when I first went to Tractor Supply? We did that, yeah, 10 years ago. You know what, let's take another approach. Let's try something different. Give me your thoughts, and, let's do, and you know, you find out the little wins sometimes add up to big, to big successes. And the last thing servant leaders are good at is building community. Servant leaders attract other servant leaders. I can tell you many of my friends are servant leaders. It's ironic, but they are. Now, here's the other downside of servant leadership in some ways. You get the, Greg, we really would like you to take it, you know. Next thing you know, you're, you're, you're really strapped with a lot of things that people are asking you they'd like you to get involved in. And sometimes you have to put up your hand and say, okay, I've, I've got enough on my plate right now. I can't take on any more because I don't want to do something halfway. I either do it 100% or I don't do it. So that's something in servant leadership you have to remember. If you're really going to commit yourself to it, understand your limitations. You know, don't get yourself overcommitted. So if I had to think of the 10 characteristics, if I just throw them out, some of these are a little bit repetitive. It's listening, empathy, healing, self-awareness. Boy, the self-awareness piece is the one that I can't tell you. I probably separated a tractor, three very senior executives, because they lost their ability to be self-aware. These are people that were making several million dollars a year. But you know what? Once you lose that self-awareness, you lose the self-respect of people. People don't trust you any longer. And the next thing you know, don't let the door hit you on the way out is kind of the, what happens. You know? And I was very good about it and very nice. And I coached and, and mentored. But when you can see where someone just doesn't get it and doesn't fit, it's time for them to move on and be successful someplace else. That's a tough thing. It's a tough lesson to, to teach some individuals. But I felt I did it in the right way. I, said, I talked about persuasion before. Conceptualization. Being able to give someone a vision of where things can go. Servant leaders are good at that. I mean, think of uh, one of our great war heroes, uh, Eisenhower. You know, I mean, think of people that led men, that knew men were going to go into battle and they were going to lose 70% of them on the first wave. They went anyway, willingly. Boy, talk about persuasion. I don't know about you, if someone told me, I know you're going to get killed, but we want you to go out in there anyway, you know? But die for your country. You know, Veterans Day being kind of, you know, kind of interesting. By the way, thank you for your service. But um, that's, and you think about some of the people I mentioned, how persuasive they were. Foresight, being able to look around the corner. Um, again, being a good steward of, of maybe, you know, the things that you have and the things that you can give others. Um, growing your people and then building community. All of these things tie in one way, shape, or form to servant leadership. Um, I didn't realize I was doing it, <laughs> but I kept thinking back. And so I ran across a gentleman, uh, Mr. Greenleaf, who had written a number of books on servant leadership. And I said, you know, this guy is, he, he, what he's talking about is what I think I'm doing. And the more I studied it, the more I read about it, the more I convinced myself, I think this is what it is. I'm, I'm, I'm practicing servant leadership. And um, I felt you know, as an organization at Tractor, that we have a very steeped culture there. Or, and we had, we still, they still do. I shouldn't say we, I'm not there any longer. But, but it's a very, very deep culture. And it is a servant leadership culture. And we put our customers and our suppliers and everyone else before ourselves. And it, and it really did um, propel the company through tough times, through a recession, and through other tough times, through COVID and whatever else. But if you speak to anyone who works there, the first thing they'll mention to you is the culture. And the culture is based off of a servant leadership model. And that's something that, um, I don't know how many companies out there really practice it today, but if more did, um, they'd be more successful companies. I can tell you that, because it works. Uh, the turnover of tractor supply is very low. Uh, people like to go to work there and stay working there. If they do move on, it's probably for something that in their own mind, they should have you know, been given an opportunity sooner in, in their career, but rarely do people move on because they don't enjoy the culture, they don't enjoy the servant leadership model that, that is, it is preached and lived there. Now, there's not a bunch of moonies, you know, and you know, people that are, you know, you know, everyone's got a certain special handshake and all that. 
But um, it is something that, you know, and there are organizations that do that, you know, this, this thing. But we're not that, that's not the way the company is. The company really <laughs> is uh, centered around server leadership as the base, um, and then, you know, customers and, uh, you know, the team member comes first. And I was telling Ray a while back, when I would visit stores, um, I'd only go with a small group, maybe four of us, and I would dress very casual. You would never know that I was the CEO of Tractor Supply when I walked in the store. And you wouldn't know because there wasn't an entourage. I didn't believe in that kind of a visit. I would spend most of my time with the team members, customers, the receiver in the back of the store, you know. Who knows the work better? Who knows the faults that we have, okay, and the issues better than the people doing the work? So that's who I talked to. That's where I spent my time. And I took all the notes. No one else in the management group took notes. I took all the notes. Now, there was a reason for that. When we leave, okay, and we get back in the car and drive to the next store, we would discuss what we saw, whatever. I would recap those notes at the end of the week, usually Friday morning about 6 o'clock. I would get in early. I was an early riser. And um, then I would push out to the different individuals, okay, we heard this, what are you going to do about it? And we would then get back to those individual stores with responses. They could count on it. And I think that floored them because we would not only take the time to come visit them, but we would actually respond and, and address things. You know, I mean, it, this wasn't a, a dress up visit, this was a learning visit. We were out in stores to build a better company, to address their customers' needs, you know, better. I was telling Ray, you know, we had uh, stores in all, well, uh, we had no stores um, in Alaska yet. So, 49 states. But, uh, you can imagine the differences in assortments and how you have to, you know, try to address the needs of customers in Texas versus those in New York State versus Utah or Arizona. Very difficult. But because we had this servant leadership model, the flow of information back and forth and the, the us serving them, our, our office here was called the Store Support Center. It was not called the corporate office. That was on purpose, we called it the store support center because where's the customer? Where are most of the people in the company? They're in the field and in DCs. The DCs are 300 people, each of them. And there's, I think you have 10 DCs now, so. But most of the people are out in your stores. That's who you, that's who you, you have to talk to. That's who you, you learn from. So I won't say we were perfect and I will never tell you that you know, things can't be improved. And I, couldn't, I could have done a lot of things better, but I, I wrote a lot of notes to people um, thanking them for their, you know, what they did for the customers or what they, you know, how they, they, they stood up for the company. Um, and I commended them on, you know, their ability to be good servant leaders. And I heard story after story when I visit stores. I have store managers send me emails about things. You know, I mean, I would never let an opportunity go by where I couldn't thank someone or reward someone for a job well done particularly if they, they took the time to, to address the problem. And Ray's gonna give you an example of something that happened to us in an airport. We ran into one another. But um, servant leadership is not for everybody, okay? And um, what I will say to you is um, there's some great books out there if you wanna read more about it. Um, a couple of uh, people that I think have, have done well, Fred Smith of FedEx. That's a servant leadership company, whether you know it or not. If you ever worked there, you know someone works there. That's how they, their model is, is set up. Starbucks, Howard Schultz. Mm -hmm. How many of you know WD-40? How many of you have it a can in your, in your garage? Okay, read about that company, servant leadership company. Only they call their team tribe members. They use the word terminology tribe. There are some very good examples out there of different companies that have embraced this and I will tell you that those are the companies you can look at today and say, you know, who's performing fairly well? Most of those companies are. Mm -hmm. Ray and I were talking when I first got the tractor, um, there was a lot of things that needed to be done and, and you know, there was, it's, there's never enough money, right? But for the first year, year and a half, we had to really kind of reestablish who we were, why we wanted to exist and um, had to gain alignment. Once we gained that, I mean, you know, we were a, a billion three in sales, about a billion five market cap. Take a look at the market cap today. It's over 25 billion. 
there's a lot of people that helped build that. And that company is not only financially healthy, but its culture is even stronger today. Hal's done a wonderful job uh, continuing with the culture, feeding the culture, doing the things for the team members through COVID and, uh, and beyond. And I mean, the things that you can read on um, Facebook or on the internet are amazing. How people love their jobs, love to come to work. They don't call it work. They come to serve customers. I mean, it, it's truly amazing. I mean, it's transformational. So servant leadership can transform companies, can transform lives. People can, can really benefit from it personally as well as professionally. I've seen it, and, and I'm telling you, it's, it's, a, it's a very powerful tool. So think about yourself. Think about how you operate. Think about the, uh, uh, maybe the, whether where you work or how you work. How can you change that to be more of a servant leader? And, you know, push others around you up. You know, build up other people. Help make them successful. They'll make you successful. As a CEO, I can tell you, you have a lot less control than you think. The job's very different than most, most people would, would acknowledge. And if you, if you do not have your people's trust and um, they don't believe in um, your leadership style and how you treat them, um, you will fail miserably. Um, you know, regardless of what Wall Street may say about you, um, that doesn't matter. We never, I never thought about Wall Street in any decision I made. I always thought about my customers first and my, my team members in the company. How is this going to impact them? You know, is this good for them? Is this good for their families? I mean, yeah, I felt, you know, I felt the, 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 the pressure sometimes of 45,000 people, you know. I mean, their livelihood depended upon sometimes the decisions that, you know, I or a group of us would make. But, I, you know, I went back to the servant leadership principles all the time, and, and we made what we thought were the best decisions. And so I'll leave you with that. I mean, it's, um, it's a powerful tool, and um, it's one that um, I could speak on for days and give you examples. So I think we may want to talk about a couple examples here okay. because just don't you, if you want to throw the first fastball about uh, well, when I we actually, met in an airport. I yeah. ran into you in the airport, actually. We did. Well, and actually, I was going to be nice to you and say <laughs> that we, uh, we, we have a steady stream of uh, track supply employees uh, coming through the MBA program. And, uh, and that's, that's sort of what has convinced me. I mean, because they're the ones who talk about you and servant leadership. Uh, I mean, all the way down to uh, they thought you had your own personal parking spot, but then they realized the only you don't. The only reason you are there up front is because you get there at 6 in the morning. Well, we'll give you a little quick story on that. It's kind of funny. I always tell people, listen, if you want a great parking spot in the garage area, get here early, you know, because there's no reserved spots. Well, I was the first one in the garage in the morning. And when you first pull in, there's three spots that are fairly close to the wall, but, you know, kind of protect your car. So I pull in the first slot every morning, you know, pull in. And, and of course, the, the, every morning the people would come in and they go, ah, you know, who's in that spot? They finally realized it was me. So then it became a game. When Greg would pull out to go over to Lipscomb to do something or go downtown for a meeting, guess what? When I come back, there'd be somebody in that spot, which was fine because I left that spot and now I can park, park on the third level, you know, whatever. But, but I, 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 would, I would tell them, you know, it's, uh, you know, servant leadership is, you know what, I happen to be there first, but you know what, it's my gift to you because I left. Whoever wants to grab that spot next can have it. And believe me, they did every time. <laughs> well, now I feel better because uh, he called me from the parking lot and he said, hey, I see my name on the parking spot, but someone's in it. <laughs> so, so what did I do? Being, being kind of a creative guy, I said, Ray, is it okay if I kind of switch the name plates on the thing? He said, well, sure. So yeah. I'm, I'm, it, my name is in front of my car now. You know, so <laughs> all I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's legit. Well, on, on that theme, though, but... Tell, do you remember what you told me about, uh, hey, I don't have a corporate jet. Who's my corporate jet? Southwest. As a matter of fact, the CEO of Southwest sent me a whole box of peanuts one time because I had commented 
to an analyst in New York, they were saying to me, yo, Greg, the day that you buy a corporate jet today, we're gonna sell your stock. And I said, well, our corporate jet is Southwest Airlines. <laughs> and guess what? That's never gonna happen. Within three weeks, he had, somebody had said something to somebody. Next thing I know, I get this huge box of Southwest, you know, peanuts. You know, they used to give away peanuts. I'm not sure they do anymore. At least I have in the last couple flights I've been on. They give you now pretzels or something. But, uh, but anyway, and he sent me the thing, and, and Gary is you know, there, and he goes, I just want to thank you for the plug, you know, for the advertising. <laughs> and uh, so I sent him a care package back of all kinds of jackets and tractor stuff, whatever. And I didn't know this, but he has two grandsons, and I sent him several tractors and a couple of trucks or tractors. He sent me pictures. I mean, it was like we, we, we developed this relationship over it. Um, but yeah, we don't, uh, as a company, um, and by the way, I fly, um, you know, in the back of the bus with everybody else. We don't, we, we don't, even if we were on a United or whatever, no first class. No, we fly coach. And I'm sitting right there with everybody else, you know, and that's just the way it is. I mean, we, that we don't, that's spending the shareholders' money. That's not being a servant leader. That's just not the way it is. And, uh, yeah. Recently, labor reports have come out that millions of Americans are quitting their jobs. Yeah, we were talking about that a few minutes and ago. Great question. People don't leave companies, they leave bad bosses or bad people. That's a fact. Secondly, I will tell you that COVID took its toll on a lot of individuals. Um, many who, who needed that social engagement at work, they, they, they thrived for that. And when they were basically pushed into a cocoon and working from home and it was you know virtual, and listen, I did a number of the virtual things through 2020, even though I retired early in 2020. Um, you know, I think, I think it has, well, the great resignation, as they call it, okay, two things. One is um, that, that isolation piece was really working on people. So um, some people just couldn't deal with it, and I think they, they needed some time to regroup. The second thing, though, was when the workforce tightened up and a lot of people were laid off and the government stepped in to pay basically pay them for staying at home they kind of liked that and so they said you know what i'm not going to go back to my 13 dollar or 15 dollar an hour job by the way my i remember my first job i was paid a dollar 39 per hour as a stock boy okay that's how old i am so i mean but that's, you know that's that that's a big far cry from 15 bucks but i think what happened was um People said, well, I'm just going to hold out, and I'm gonna, I can, I'll find a job that's $18 an hour or whatever. I mean, so there's a, there's, a, there's a real problem in this country right now of underemployment. Um, go on vacation, and if you stay in a hotel, they tell you, well, we may come to make up your room once during your stay of a week or so. They have no, because no one wants to do housekeeping for, you know, that person can go to work at, someplace else making five, ten dollars an hour more. Um, it's, it's, I, I can't give you an answer. I can't tell you how it's going to resolve itself, although I will say once the, uh, the, uh, uh, the funds from the government have run out, and they will by the end of the year, we may start to see the workforce start to balance back a little bit next year. People have to, they have to work to eat. I mean, so I'm, I'm not sure, you know, the government can't keep handing out, you know, stimulus checks. Uh, but there were a lot of dynamics in that. It wasn't just one thing. Yeah, well, some people said, hey, I can work from home. And I can be here with my kids. Hey, I'm just going to work from home. I'll take a job at less than I was making before possibly. I mean, it's kind of ironic. I get probably once a week, maybe twice a week, an email from Amazon saying, we'd like to hire you for, so you can work from home. Where did they get my name, number one? <laughs> and number two, I have no interest in working for Amazon. You know, I mean, so, but, but it, I get this, you know, I'm, I, told them, I said, look, Amazon wants me, honey. honey, honey. <laughs> but um, I think you're going to find it will start to edge back over time. Um, but um, 
there were a lot of moving parts, and there still are. And until those things kind of sort out, hmm. it's going to be difficult. I, I mentioned about you know some companies that are having good retention. There are some that are doing well. My son-in-law runs the hub for FedEx and Ed O'Hare. A job none of you would, in this room would want. It's a crazy job. It's 18 hours a day plus. I mean, it's nuts. He'll die young if he's, I told him, if you don't watch it, you're gonna die of a heart attack. But uh, he's got 100 jobs open. They'll pay $25 an hour. You don't have to have any experience. Just please come to work. I mean, I, I, I'm just, you know, I'm shocked at that, but that's what's going on. Yep. I, I know we got, oh, go ahead. Go ahead and ask. People, people, simple answer, people come first. <laughs> okay. I'm serious, people come first. Take care of your people first. Whether that's, I gotta give Sally, she's gotta leave every day at three because she's gotta pick up the kids at school, whatever, and you know, she, maybe she comes in earlier or, you know, whatever. You, 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 you cannot be successful without people that believe in you, trust you, and will give you their all. Um, I learned that many years ago. Um, I had an assistant uh, when I was a buyer back at Federated many years ago. I started in Cincinnati, Ohio at, at Shillitoe's. Anybody here know, remember Shillitoe's in Cincinnati? Very nice department store, high-end department store, part of the Federated division, which was Bloomingdale's and wasn't Macy's then. Macy's was the enemy, you know. We were Abraham and Strauss and all the other stores. Lazarus, Columbus, anyway. And uh, this gal that worked for me, she's still a good friend of mine to this day. She said, you know, Greg, you were so intense and so, like, business-like. She goes, I had to take Valium every day before I came in the office. <laughs> I said, what? Sarah, really? You know, that's the couple that's coming to visit with us this yeah. weekend. Um, she's done very well, by the way. But, but I said, I, so I didn't know that. before. She yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if she has or not. But, but it, it's funny. I mean, I, I never realized. And she helped me kind of understand that I was just too intense. You know, I, was, I wasn't thinking about people and her. I was thinking about the job and the people above me and the results and all that. And uh, I was not a good servant leader early in my life. But I became a better servant leader over time when I saw that it's about people. All the machines in the world, all the, you know, automated systems you have can't replace people. And uh, in the industry that I was in, I always, I live by this motto, hire those who are smarter and more driven than you and you'll be successful. I would add to that last thing, get out of their way. Right, let them do their job. Uh, Don't micromanage. Okay, I'll give, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to give you a little storyline on this, okay? This was a very senior level executive who I was not actually traveling with at the time, but he was traveling with one of the regionals. Now, regional would have, say, 300 stores. And then the district manager was along with them, and they were visiting a store. This individual, um, so I found, was... Um, walking into stores, and you know, we have a, a team member break room. You have to have that in every store. And um, we have lockers back there. We don't typically put locks on the lockers because it's people about, you know, they all work together. So he's walking back there, and we have a bulletin board back there with all the company paraphernalia on it, and then they post other things, pictures of family and customers, whatever. Anyway, it's kind of a fun place to be. He walks over to one of the um, team members uh, lockers, and he notices there's a bag of potato chips and there's lunches in there. So he reaches in, opens it up, takes the bag of potato chips out, and starts eating them. Now this is a guy that's making $2 million plus a year. 
the regional and the DM were like, and the store manager were like, what are you doing? That's such and such is lunch. Oh, they won't, they won't miss it. Now, what was that an example of? That was an example of entitlement. He thought he was entitled because of who he was. I had never heard of such a thing before in my life. So I, this story come, came to me you know, a few days after the trip. Then I started kind of noticing the individual's other um, uh, behaviors. This individual had come into the company from the outside, okay, and had been with the company about a year and a half, and had been mentored for the first year by the former, his, the guy he was replacing. So he really, this was the first six months we'd seen who he really was. Um, so here's another little bit, bit of the storyline goes on. So here we are, it's Thanksgiving weekend, and Thanksgiving weekend in retail, management team on Friday morning at 5 a.m. meets at the store sports center, and we jump in cars, and we go out, and we work in the stores. We are physically bagging, helping, taking care of customers. That's what happens. I don't care who you are, you are out in the stores. So he was supposed to be out in the stores in Florida because he had a home down in Florida and he was supposedly going to be working stores. So I pinged him a couple of times on Friday and again on Saturday and I wasn't getting any response. I thought that's kind of odd. So I called my IT, my CIO, and I said, do me a favor, ping his phone. I want to know where he is. Guess where he was? The Bahamas. He was let go that Monday when he came back. So he, 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 he was this individual who thought he was bigger than life. He thought he was above everyone else. He was conducting himself. And by the way, when, after I let him go, of course, then all the regionals come in and start telling me all the horror stories. I'm like, what is going on with you people? Why didn't you come to me before? Well, he threatened us. I said, you should have told me because I would have made quick, you know, mincemeat of him and, and see you. But um, we could tell that he wasn't, he wasn't a good fit, and we also could tell that, you know, um, that kind of character, I didn't, I didn't care, I didn't, wasn't going to stay. There's one other thing that you said was, and I will paraphrase this as saying, never miss the opportunity to build somebody up. You got it, never. So, I'm going to do that right now because I flew in this morning and I did that critical thing. All my pens and pencils are in my briefcase at, at the hotel. So I, I wanted to make your notes, you know, I sit here and I go, and I look at my pen and I'm looking around, okay, I just put a, felt a tap on my shoulder and a lady gives me a pen, pencil, to do it. So I want this lady right here to know. <laughs> there you go. Uh, no, thank you. Yeah. You ought to hire her. <laughs> It's self-aware, losing self-awareness and losing the ability to understand, um, you know, your place, I guess, is, is one of the things I see more executives stumble with as they, as they come through the ranks. They, they, they all of a sudden start to believe it's about them. And they forget that it wasn't about them. That's how they got there. It's all these people that helped, you know, push them up and bring them up. Um, and when you, when you lose that self-awareness, and you start focusing on yourself, it's trouble. It's trouble. I know you're quivering with anticipation saying, what is this airport story you mentioned? <laughs> <laughs> but the- uh, There's two actually. There's yeah, two there's, there's two. But uh, we were together as, I, I guess it's called Williamson Inc., uh, Williamson Chamber of Commerce, the county next to here. And- uh, We traveled to Austin. We went to Austin. Remember that, remember the, we'd set out and we sat out in that, that second floor balcony area until about two in the morning, talking. Yeah. Literally, I mean, just talking, talking about life talking. and things. And I mean, we did it for like what, three nights in a row, I think. Yeah, no, it was, it was a good group. And the yeah. idea was to study uh, what Austin had and compare it to Nashville and what we yeah. could bring back and improve. It was a great group. And so on the way back, you know, we're in a group. We basically filled up that whole Southwest Plain with all the uh, various business leaders and government leaders in this Davis and Williamson County. So a lot of people were running around the airport shopping, and for some reason, you and I weren't. And we were sitting there at the gate and talking, and somehow, and, you know, where you have the seats back to back. And so somehow the word tractor supply came up. And then there's the individual we've never met in our life sitting behind us, 
all of a sudden jumped in our conversation and I and he came right around and sat down uh, like, he, you know, I, was, wanna, I got something to tell you you he, know he was intense and because he thought we both worked for tractors or he, I think he said you guys work he, for tractor of course supply. what he do no he works for tractor supply yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I could tell with his anger uh, that I don't work for tractor supply. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'll let you, you can tell him what you what happened. Well, there. so he 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 be, he began to say, "Listen, you know, I, I've always bought your stock tanks because they're really high quality and all that. But you guys have really lost your quality edge here. Instead of them welding the bottom into the stock tank, now now they're putting it in with some type of rubberized lubricant stuff. And he goes, you know, it just doesn't hold up the same. And by the way." You know, the little spigot on the side where you, you know, you can drain the water out. The, he said, that's plastic now. It used to be metal. He goes, I'm just going to, so I looked at him and I said, you know what? I want to write all this down. You know, I, I, you make a very good point. I said, you know, we've been buying from the same manufacturer for years. I'm going to find out if we've got a kind of a quality issue here because you would not be the first person. I mean, it's going to show up in the returns, right? What did I find? Went back, we pulled the numbers, and even the buyer wasn't aware of it that we, we had a problem. And so what we did is we told the manufacturer, you're changing your process. You're going back to welding, no more of this rubberized stuff. And you're putting a metal, you know, spigot on this tank going forward because that's what our customers want. And then we shipped this man, I think we shipped him about six of them for your charge yeah. and said, thank you very much. No, but again, one of the things you learn and you have to be, you gotta, you gotta remember that feedback is a gift. Yes, it can be painful, and yes, it can be unfriendly, and yeah, it can be uncomfortable listening to a customer complaining, you know, and ripping you a new one. But if they're caring enough about your company and about what you're selling and feel like this could help you and make a better company, you need to listen. Yeah. And so that's what that was. It was really his feedback. Yeah. And the whole time I'm saying, Greg, tell him you're the CEO and just tell yeah. him, you know, what never. to do He with never this. knew who I was. He never, but I sat there, yeah. I was amazed. You never said, you just said, so yeah. kindly, yeah. tell me more and writing it down and just, mm -hmm. and the gentleman, the very irate gentleman never knew who he was talking to. Now, of course, after you took that down, then he, he saw, he calmed down and he saw that, hey, you were paying attention. Mm -hmm. Still didn't know listening. who you were. Remember what I said? One of the things? Yeah. Listening, li really yeah. listening. And then he turned around and says, okay, now let me tell you about those ropes. <laughs> yeah. Well, then he wanted to talk about <laughs> rope. And I said, okay, tell me, what is it about rope? And he goes, you know, I don't understand. He said, I can go in and buy a 20-foot or a 40-foot extension cord in your store, but I can't buy pre-cut rope. And I said, sir, well, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an issue with pre-cut. I mean, you know, we don't know, is it 20-foot, 40-foot, 5-foot, 10? You know, we have these huge rolls where you can roll off 100-foot. I said, I don't think we're going to be doing pre-cut rope. I mean, you know, because it's, it's kind of a unique thing. You know, it's not like a 40-foot extension cord. You know, you need so much rope to do whatever. But he wasn't he didn't happy, didn't like that answer, but I, I was honest with him about I don't <laughs> think we're going to be doing, you know, that. So I've got a quick story. So yeah. I, was, I was telling uh, Ray, you know, that uh, when I traveled, personal and even professional, I used to carry my tractor supply backpack. And it, you know, it was emblazoned on their tractor supply, and people didn't know who I, who I was. They just knew I probably worked for tractor supply. So I would get a lot of conversations would get started with that. You'd see it sitting in a chair next to me. But oh, you work for tractor? Oh, I love that store. First thing they'd say, I love that store. You know. Well, we were in uh, flying from Nashville to Orlando. We were going to go on from Orlando, I think, on to Naples, maybe whatever. But. Um, a little girl and her parents were walking across. Now, my, think of me, and my back is to the planes. I'm on that last row there by the glass. And this little girl walks by and she goes, Daddy, Daddy, tractor supply. She noticed the logo on my backpack and came running toward me. And her father's like behind her, and I'm like, why am I told my wife, I said, this little girl's coming over here, I don't know. So she <laughs> runs up to me and she goes, she goes, tractor supply. She goes, my daddy and there go there every Saturday morning we go to tractor supply. I said, well, great. I, I looked at her dad. I said, is it okay if I talk to your daughter? You know, because, I mean, she's probably four years old. I'm like, you know. He goes, sure. So I start talking to her, and I found out, you know, her name is Margot. And I said, you know, what is, what is it you do? Well, you know, I go, we go in there, and we buy our horse feed and different. They have a small farm. And uh, she also buys some little animals that, you know, are up in front on the, the, the fixtures there, which are, it's the, it's the kid bait. That's what it is. We knew that. But anyway, um, she was so excited 
because she, she, like, it, it brought these, I guess, very happy memories to her. So I said to her parents, can you give me her, your, your address and all that, and I'll make sure that we send something to Margo, and maybe a couple things for you too, you know. And they said, well, sure. So they gave me the address and all that stuff. So as soon as I landed, I called my, uh, my right hand, Sherry, and I said, Sherry, we got a little work to do here. We got to put together a a big package of stuff, and it's from Margo and her parents, whatever. And anyway, we sent this huge package of stuff. And uh, when Margo got home from Disney, not only did she have a good time at Disney, but then she had this huge, like, early Christmas, you know. And I will tell you, they sent me pictures probably for a week, you know, <laughs> to her playing with stuff, doing things, whatever. And I was telling, you know, Ray, you can't buy that. That is an experience that that little girl at that young age had and she's probably today a teenager. She's still probably in love with Tractor Supply, which is wonderful. You know, I told our marketing department, I said, we need to start younger. You know, we're too, I mean, we need the young ones are, you know. But it is amazing the, the uh, things that you, you run into when people see certain, you know, things. Yeah. Greg, you, you spoke a lot about culture yep. um, and how important that is. And clearly, uh, Tractor Supply has a unique culture. But By the way, I didn't, I didn't develop it. I give Joe uh, uh, Scarlett and uh, the former CEO uh, credit for that. Um, I was just a steward of it. Well, just, you, you, you know. Uh, Beating your punch there. Yeah. So, my question was um, for those that might not be in a servant leadership company culture, how do you influence the culture in that direction? How do you change Boy, it? Boy, um, it's, it's kind of, you know, you, you do it one, at a t one person at a time. I would tell you, though, before you should sign on to any company, if you're moving companies, whatever, understand the culture. Don't jump for the money. It isn't worth it. Go there because it fits you. You know, it, it's either, it's, it's, it fits your personal um, either objectives or your style or your, your beliefs, you know, your, your, it, it's got to be something more than just the money. Trust me, I have, throughout my entire career, I never thought about money. I always thought about, I don't, I don't want it to be work. I want it to be something I'm passionate about and I love to do. And my wife would tell you that, you know, she was the retail widow, you know, for many years because whatever it took, that's what I, I did, you know at any job I had in, in the business. I never missed my birth of my three children. I never missed the, the important parties and recitals and things. And I even coached them, you know, in sports and that. But um, in, in my line of work, you travel a lot. You travel a lot. And um, you have to make family time important and it's a priority. When you're home, it's family. Yeah, you're 24 seven maybe up here, but you're, you gotta be with the family when you got family time. But, but uh, don't, don't sell yourself short. Don't sign on to a company just because someone's throwing a bunch of money in front of you. There's a reason for that, typically. <laughs> they can't get the kind of people they want, so they feel they have to pay more, you know? Go with a company that's got a great culture that fits you, and trust me, you'll be much happier. You'll, your career will accelerate faster, and, and it won't be work. You know, I never considered what I did was work. I felt I was on kind of a, you know, a, and not a mission, but, you know, I was, we were always building things, you know, growing things, you know, and um, that's what got me excited. You know, even though we went, I went through a couple of times at Federal where we downsized divisions combined and all this kind of crazy stuff. But, um, you know, it's find the fit for you. And they're out there. You just got to take your time and, and don't jump at the first offer and, and, you know, sometimes you can may find that, you know what, maybe it's a little less money, but you can negotiate them up. By the way, never accept the first offer either. Always negotiate. It's a weakness if you do, by the way. It's perceived as a weakness. Well, we got some faculty here, so don't. No, <laughs> no, no, no clues. No, don't, that's don't. what I'm talking about when you go into the workforce, you know, first time, whatever. Yeah, it's no, good to push back a little bit and challenge. <laughs> no, just kidding. Okay, yeah, let's, let's take one more question here. Sure. I have not read his book yet. I didn't know that he had put one out, but I will probably get it now. But I think Michael Dell's a good example of a guy that I think has got a great heart. And, and he, he, he didn't do it for the money either. He did it because what he, I mean, what he loved. What he loved was, you know, the machines that could make this stuff happen, right? And, 
And yeah, there's a lot of software involved and all that. That was, you know, part of the thing. But um, most of these entrepreneurs never even thought they would ever be as successful as they were. Right. You know? Yeah. I can make a living doing this, yeah. But he had, I remember, what was it, what was the, uh, there was another company that used to have the, the cow boxes for their computers. Gateway, another one. That was one that was maybe mismanaged a little bit, you know. They were kind of battling with, with Dell, but, um, you know, I would think if you had, if you had a, a straight on conversation with Michael Dell, I think no different than other entrepreneurs like that would say, I had no idea it was gonna be what it was gonna be, you know. Um, and they would maybe call it blind luck, or they may say just you know right, right place at the right time. But I think it's more than that. You know, he had he he really felt like there was a need, and there was, you know, for for good good computers and you know things that could run. And my son's in the business. He he's a consultant, computer consultant, and he when his machine, you know, has a problem, he's got three of them works on. He's looking at three screens all the time. I'm like, I don't know what you're looking at here. Which which one? Where you're <laughs> focusing? You know, but. Um, it's, um, it's important stuff. And when they crash, I mean, what do you do? You, know, you <laughs> either reboot or you find a new machine because you know, uh, these things do wear out at, over time. I mean, you know, he, he, I, don't, I think he go, he's went through, he's been with this company now three years and he's been through a second computer already. One of them, just wears them out. Well, Greg, thank you. Thank you very much for spending thank time you. with us. By the way, if, if any, if there's students here, if you ever want to, I always make this offer. If you ever want to have lunch or dinner or something, you want to talk about your career, or you want to talk about whatever, um, Ray knows how to get a hold of me. I've probably met with eh, 25, 30 probably individuals yeah. already. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to, you know, some of them say, hey, can you get me a, uh, an interview at Tractor? Yeah, I probably could. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you gotta, you got to want to, you know, understand that, that, that culture there and understand what that company's about. Yeah. But now, see, I was going to say, too, see, now, he, he flew back from Florida just to see us. Well, but I know that's not true. He was, that's what I thought, and I, was, I thought, this is great. It but was until our friends called until your friends. and said, we want to come up and visit. Because you okay. felt guilty. He has some friends coming to stay with him next, uh, next week. But now I realize you just feel guilty because you made her take Valium all the time. <laughs> You know, I, I mean, I, that's a, I feel bad about that. I really do. I don't know if that's true. She always gives me that plug. But Sarah's a very bright young lady, and she was an up-and-comer, and, you know, she became a buyer and went on, and she's now the, uh, she works at the Carter Company. She's one of their principals, one of the three principals there in, in Atlanta. But, um, you know, I, I was, I knew I was intense. I mean, I was, you know, I was all business back then, and, uh, in Federated, it was not a servant leadership culture. It was a either eat or be eaten. You know, those kind of cultures where if you don't produce, we got somebody waiting at the door that'll slot in and, you know. And uh, I, I stayed there 13 years and decided that, you know, I'd had enough. And I moved on to other things and uh, I'm glad I did. Because they're, they're a shadow of a company they once were. You know, Macy's, listen, great brand and all that, but I don't know about you, but uh, there's plenty of places to shop and, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, it's not the company it once was many years ago, unfortunately, and a lot of that's the dynamics of retail. Let's face it, it's, it's very shifted away. I'm just fortunate I came through the ranks when the training programs and that were as, as robust as they were and, and, you know, I mean, they taught us everything. I mean, that, there's nothing I can't probably talk to in retail because of that initial five years I spent training and all that. And we were ready to go, man. Once they got us ready, it was like, go do it. You know, and we could, we could deliver. So I give them that credit, but uh, not too many companies spend that money anymore. We, Tractor Supply still does. They still have training programs and things inside the company for different aspects of the business. But now, if you're in marketing, if you're in supply chain, if you're merchandising, if you're in store ops, uh, if you're in IT, I mean, it, these are all different segments today. So last thing is retail is not a bad place because there's plenty of opportunity and there's lots of different aspects of it. It isn't just, you know, working behind, you know, a, a register ringing up, you know, do you want, you know, a, a large fries with that or a large Coke? You know, no, that's not retail today. 
there's a lot of things behind retail, and uh, it's, it's an exciting industry. It really is. It's been through its ups and downs, but I did it for 42 years, and you know what? I wouldn't trade a day of it. I'd do it again if I was 40 years younger. <laughs> well, right. I'm going to do, do a real quick commercial here. Um, you know, there's a couple of books out there if you're interested, but this one here, Speak Up, a very almost recent uh, graduate. In fact, I see you, Jared. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to make a testimonial here, but do you believe it graduated in 2019, and now he's already selling his book, uh, Speak Up, uh, A Young Adult's Guide to Engage in Difficult Conversations, Address Conflict, and Earn Respect. Uh, and we're very proud, I mean, your book and what you've done. Can I get you to give a, a one testimonial for those here, because Lipscomb family, but you went for a, a quite impressive, uh, not an internship, it was a management training program at SunTrust. We had never had anyone selected for that before, very competitive. And, um, and what, what was one thing they told you? Because yeah, you, they selected you. Well, that's a, that's a credit to you, and, uh, and I appreciate you sharing that, sharing that with us. Yeah. <laughs> and the other quick commercial I'll do, there's, there's another book out there. Hannah's not with us. I don't think Hannah's here right now. It's called Wisdom-Based Business, Applying Biblical Principles and Evidence-Based Research for a Purposeful and Profitable Business. She runs our Center for Supply Chain. If we had more time, we could talk about supply, supply chain, chain or the lack <laughs> of supply chain. Uh, Greg obviously has a lot of insight uh, on that. Um, you may have a question after this if you want to ask Greg. Uh, but she uh, runs our Center for Supply Chain in this uh, book based off the books of wisdom, Psalms and Proverbs. And uh, it's a business book, uh, fully a business-based book, but based on the wisdom of the Bible. And so it's, we're very proud of Hannah. I read it. And uh, I read that book. It's a good book. Okay. So testimonial. It's a good testimonial. book. She, she draws some very interesting, uh, I don't know, say comparisons and, and things in the book. Yeah. Back to, to biblical. So. Well, I'll pass that on to Hannah. Yeah, it's good. And now her next book, then she can get <laughs> you to write a, write a forward on it. <laughs> Uh, no, that's very good. And then now, see, now, Jared, now you need to take a photo. Here, here, <laughs> here, here's Greg up here reading your book. Start, okay. start, I'm starting to cheating. I have, I have, a, I have a, young, a younger son, a younger 28, that um, really doesn't deal with conflict well. He just doesn't. He's got little slight Asperger's. You never know it if you met him probably, but when he comes to conflict, he avoids it like the plague. I mean, and I'm like, I told him, I said, Kyle, you know, for the life, son, you know, you're not, it's not going to be, you know, you know, rose petals and, you know, and puppy dogs all the time, you know, <laughs> so there's going to be times you're going to have to stand up and that, and he really struggles with it, and uh, he's a big guy, 6'3", 220, you know, you don't want to mess with him, I mean, he, he can hurt you, you know, but he's, he's just, he's a, he's just, that's the way he is, his way he's built, and so I'm hoping this may have some insights, I'm going to read it first, and I'll give it to him. <laughs> okay. And I have a gift for you, it's kind of heavy, so I won't hand it to you right now. But yeah. uh, let's, let's thank Greg again. I, I really thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Man. I, I, I really, I do enjoy coming over here and speaking. And, you know, there's a lot we could, I could talk for hours, like I said. But um, be true to yourself, you know, is probably the thing I'd leave you with. Be true to yourself. Uh, be who you are. And, and be accepted for who you are. And, um, you know, live life with some type of, uh, you know, um, ethics, um, the one thing I will tell you, you never, as a business person, compromise is your ethics. Walk away. Walk away before you compromise your ethics. And I, I had my opportunity at a young age. I was in China and uh, pushed the envelope across the table. I was following another buyer who had been in that job. I'm like, what is that? Oh, that's our president, Bob, you know. I'm like, 
pushed it back across the table. I said, I think our in meeting is now ended. And I got him left. That cost that company, what did I tell you how many, I think it was about 300,000 dozen yes. shirts. They did everything they could possibly to get the business back, and I said no. And I had the authority, I was buying for the federated company at the time, the whole co corporation, so all the divisions, we would place the orders for that. And uh, I went back and met with my GMM sponsor, and he said, you did the right thing. He goes, move the business, and we did. So you, you'll be, you will be tested, trust me, at some point, and it's, you know, be true to yourself. Okay. Very good. Anybody got any questions or want to talk? I'll be here for a little bit. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.